now. I used to be a journalist, and some of the stories in the sports section of the US American um, newspapers are written by computer programs now, actually. Um, who knows, in a few years' time, given the advances in machine learning, the person standing here might not be me, it might be a robot. So uh, it's a very scary world, and with this backdrop, then there are all these questions that we as parents and policymakers have. What does the future hold for our children? Uh, would the way we teach them have to change? Will teachers have to change? Will technology change? Will, will it widen or narrow inequalities? And will the degree, degree still matter? Right? So with that, this is just a very quick scene setter. I'll quickly introduce the speakers now who are well qualified to touch on these topics. Our first panelist will be Dr. Lim Lai Cheng. Uh, could I invite her to join us as I introduce her? She is Executive Director of the SMU Academy and a Fellow of the Social, School of Social Sciences at SMU. She oversees SMU's Skills Future Agenda. She has extensive experience both as an educator, policymaker, as well as a school leader. Our second panelist is Dr. Tae Hui Yong. She is a lecturer at NIE's Curriculum, Teaching and Learning Academic Group. She was also, a, for many years, a teacher as well as a school leader. Our third panelist is the youngest speaker uh, for the entire day. His name is Rushdi Kairul. He is a CEO and co-founder of a startup called Reactor. They are a vendor that go around to schools uh, imparting entrepreneurial skills to students. He also sits on the Youth Council of the Singapore Human Resource Institute and has represented our country at various international forums, including the APEC Youth for Voices Summit in Beijing. All right, with that, may I invite our first speaker, Dr. Lim. Is this it? Hi, very good afternoon to all of you. Is this it? Yeah. I know this is the last section, uh, segment of the day, and I don't intend to say too much. Um, but I'm glad so many of you still stayed, because this normally doesn't happen. So you're good, good educators, and uh, people in education usually are fairly polite, and they don't just run away. You know what I'm going to talk about is really light years from where you are now because I spent close to three decades in our MOE mainstream system. But now I'm dealing a lot with adults and working professionals. And we're talking skills future all the time. And in one of the workshops that I last conducted, in the room were bankers. And they've just been made out of a job, okay? And their salary range ranges from 5000 to 35000 a month, right? So the banking and the finance industry is the most disrupted right now. And we're not talking about a structural unemployment. I think we're talking about a mega trend that's not going to be reversed. And this is really to do with technology. So if you look at these statistics, and they're not new because they've been uh, used in many different sort of articles, um, and an Oxford study that says that 47% of jobs, or 15 million of these, could be automated within the next 20 years. That means within each uh, job and which, each career, there would be portions of it which would be replaced because they can be easily automated or taken over with artificial intelligence to do more deep uh, learning. And so the jobs would disappear within that sector. And we've got another prediction that says intelligent machines will outnumber humans by 2030. And if you go to New, New Zealand, you see a lot of sheep, right? So sheep outnumber humans in New Zealand. So can you imagine now intelligent systems and robots outnumbering, outnumbering the rest of us by 2030? And factually, the top 10 in-demand jobs did not exist six years ago. Um, six years before they, they disappeared. And if 65% of our school children today will end up doing jobs not yet invented, what are schools doing about it? And all this cramming with regards to math and science and the PSLE stuff, is it going to be even relevant? So this is the basis and this is the context in which I'll be just speaking. So Leonard mentioned earlier on 
some of these. And you will get this if you just Google, right? What robots will take away from you? Which are the jobs that are going to disappear? So all the HODs here, the vice principals, you're not going to be having a great time uh, with intelligent systems. And definitely, if you're in School of Accountancy, School of Law, you'll find that you really have to change your curriculum to make yourself relevant to the undergrads because the auditing jobs are not going to be there anymore, right? And the top four auditing firms are doing a lot more M&A work, a lot more consulting work, and not the auditing work because the computer can be a lot more accurate. They work 24-7, and they don't crash uh, when they're tired. There are also a lot of these listings around, which are the jobs that are most probable in terms of being uh, deleted. And you find that perhaps then it's the high-touch ones that will still remain, right? The therapists. High flux has gone into oxygen um, therapy, and they are actually doing reverse osmosis and water treatment, but they've gone also a sideline into health care and therapy. Um, this is interesting. The fact that even sex workers can be replaced and if you've got a lovely humanoid there that looks like Scarlett Johansson, it can be very compelling. And I put this up purposely because of STB's new tagline that says, passion made possible, right? So this is passion made possible when you wear your AR augmented reality glasses and this AI just reflects everything you've ever wanted to hear about yourself and your feelings and every sort of emotional need that you have, it can fulfill. Okay, so this is the Association of Advanced, um, the American Association for Advancement in Science, and the prediction that no single job is going to be remaining as today. Oh, sorry. There is a trend that is going on in the US starting, and I think it's affecting some of our stronger or more uh, independent minded students in Singapore. And this is the movement of Uncollege. Meaning, is there a need really to pay so much for a four-year degree when actually I can get a job with certain competencies that certain industries or companies need and start right away? And why do I need to really finish my undergrad when I'm actually doing my startup? And this is something I want Rusty to comment because he obviously had those aspirations. He took a little bit of the traditional route, but he also made a decision at some stage in his life that maybe I should just do this, build on my competencies, learn on the job, and if I need to, I'll get back to university to see what I need to top up, and the university can be a revolving door. I don't need to stay four years. And the movement of Uncollege um, is also sort of uh, started from the fact that American universities are expensive, right? So do I need to commit all that amount of money to an education that might not get me anywhere because what is important is the now. The job is open now. The, um, the idea and the group of people whom I'm going to be working with, we all need to work on it now. I can't wait four or five years from graduation to do this sort of thing. The idea of then on college means if I need certain competencies and all, I can just go to any university I want to do a certain aspect of a certificate or of a course, get my digital credentialing, build up my skills, and some universities might allow me to combine all these micro skills to get a nano degree. So this is the new movement in higher education, that we can build up a degree based on micro skills and competencies that can be put together uh, which is in a way more direct and more applied to the sort of workplace. I was in uh, Stockholm and I came across this startup. It's called SCORE. And what they do is really interesting. Companies now are asking them to help them headhunt. But you don't headhunt by going through uh, a lot of CVs which tells you where this person has gotten his first degree or his postgrad and all. They hit hands by creating a game. And the game will include a lot of the skills that a certain company or corporation needs. So it could be complex problem solving, it could be serious resource allocation, it could be leading and strategizing. And so the people, are, anyone can go in to play this game and there is a leaderboard. So the top people who do best on this game 
for this particular company that requires a certain CEO or a, a top performer will then be invited in or flown in for an interview. And that is when they will then look at the person's qualifications, job trends, experience, etc. So it's the skills that they want, not the basic qualification or the degree. Right? So when earlier on Pauline was referring to asking you to raise your hands if you're hiring and whether you're looking at skills and degrees, Actually, I've been hiring people the last three years. I never look at their degrees and all. I look at the skills I want and whether people have recommended certain people to me. And when I actually uh, put up a job ad, it goes into job search and I get about 500 within like two weeks because the situation is quite bad now. Do I actually click on a CV to look at it? I try to because I feel bad. Someone has sent me his or her CV. I feel I have to at least click open the email to look at the CV. How much time do I spend looking at a CV? Two seconds. That's all I can afford. And I will zoom in on the competency I want. You know, the ability to uh, do financial accounting or meticulous. Or I will just zoom in on keywords that I want. I will not be looking at A-level results, O-level results, or the degree. So it's only when I pick the top five people I want to interview, that is when I look at any other things that might be interesting. Okay, so this is the reality now. And SCORE is useful because they also periodically put up games for people to play, and there is a leaderboard again. So anyone who wants to hire a good mind, someone who can do cross-disciplinary work, problem-solving, they will be surfaced, and they will be the ones the headhunters would zoom in to ask, are you interested in working for this corporation, looking for someone or other? So it is the skills and the competencies that matter. It's not the degree. There is another company that I really like that is set up in Singapore and it's called JobTech. So if you Google jobtech.sg, you'll find that uh, they do use a lot of artificial intelligence to help people find jobs. So they were set up because Philip Yeo wants, uh, wanted to help PMETs who are out of work or in transition. So what you have on the website would be, in real time, all the jobs that are being um, offered or posted um, across the industries. Right? So if you look at this, you will see the various sectors and the various jobs. You click on it, it will take you to the job posting, which again is focused on competencies. They will not say, I need a PhD, I need a master's, I need someone with a basic degree in finance and all that. They will list the competencies they need. And when you click on it, it will get you to um, a, a site where you can look and match whether your competencies meet these ones. And if you don't, they will point you to certain training you can do to fill the gap. So an enterprise version is really one that will replace the headhunter. Okay, so do we need headhunters? We don't, because artificial intelligence can scour and help you go through 500 CVs in one shot and tell you which are the closest match to the competencies that your job post says you need and it will allow you to just engage those top five or top three to find the top person. Okay, so it's in the interview later on that you fill in the gaps. So what I'm saying here is that there is a huge, huge gap between all that we've been discussing this morning, the struggles at the individual level between education system and educators' idea of what an education is, parents' aspirations, and the children's ability and their own preferences and all. Because the real world of work is at the moment survival. What are the skills you need? What are the people I need to get my job done? And every institution or organization is going lean. The merging of IMDA with MDA, there are other mergers coming up uh, that are going to be announced. Uh, people are just doing that just to save on manpower cost. And it's not going to be that basic degree that will shield you to say you're protected because you've got a degree from Cambridge or Edinburgh or NUS or SMU. It's, I've got this job, I need this particular person because he or she is really skillful and trustworthy. And if I replace this person, I'm just going to be looking for someone who's equally skilled. And when you look at uh, jobtech.sg, they periodically give you a report on what are the top skills that people advertise. And there are, of course, domain skills, but there are also horizontal skills. And in horizontal skills, they're always looking for people who are meticulous, who are team workers, who are able to deal with um, 
uh, Excel and some of these uh, technology platforms. They'll never say they need someone with a basic degree of an MA or a PhD in anything or any subject because that doesn't tell you what the person is competent to do and what his job experience has allowed him to develop. Okay, so in terms of what we're doing at um, the academy, we're also going into a huge exercise on recognition of prior learning, meaning mapping people on the applied skills they've acquired at work rather than the kind of skills they've acquired through their degree or university education. And that will allow us to then say, you're already at this level, let us just you know, either employ you at this level or top up your training from this level and not have you start from scratch. So I think that's going to be more powerful. I'm going to stop here and we'll just have a discussion, I hope, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lim, for that presentation on how skills matter now to employers rather than paper qualifications. Just to add on a little bit, our IPS survey actually asked parents of these primary school going kids, when your kid eventually is going to enter the workforce, will you, do you think employers will met, will place more emphasis on skills or paper qualifications, and the majority still said paper qualifications matter. So perhaps later on for the Q&A, we can discuss how to change mindsets. But for now, change the mindsets of parents. But for now, can I invite the second speaker, Dr. Tay, to, for her presentation, please. Thank you. Right. Hi, hi everyone. Um, first, a disclaimer. I'm here to talk about really key to 12, you know, um, the primary schools, the secondary schools, education, um, not as much as uh, Lai Ching has talked about in terms of higher education. And I agreed to this only because I thought, wow, this topic is safe, you know, because it's not about stress, it's not about the, <laughs> uh, the, the various very hot button issues that we've had the whole day. And this is a time to dream. Uh, what can education, the future education landscape be like? And if you allow me, uh, I'll talk you through also my own personal journey as a former school leader and when, when this question was something that bugged me. So if we think about the future education landscape, and I've put up this uh, picture on purpose, because uh, I have a good friend called Dr. Ashley Tan, and he once said, uh, half-jokingly, that in Singapore, we have managed to future-proof our education because our education looks exactly like what it was many, many years ago. And if you're not careful, the future classroom will still look like this. Um, obviously, there is something that's not satisfactory. Uh, what earlier on Suzanne said about a for this, a very factory model to our education system. I, I thought about this myself way back in 2010. What should future education, a future classroom look like uh, way back in 2010. So um, come with me. In 2010, what do you remember at that point in time? What was the technology at that point in time in 2010, seven years ago? Think of yourself seven years ago. For me, at that point in time, seven years ago, I, I remember it distinctly because uh, the one conference that changed my mind about education was not an education conference. It was a Singtel conference. It was a telco conference. Because when I went to that particular conference at that point in time, that was a time when they, wow, they were talking about cloud computing seven years ago. Now we take it for granted, cloud computing. And at that point in time, I was also like, wow, the marvel of being untethered uh, to the computer because I was carrying around my smartphone, feeling very smart, you know, wow, I can, you know, Google at that point in time and stuff like that. I was carrying a Samsung with a race, uh, you know, uh, because I, I couldn't handle um, touch screen. Uh, I thought, nah, you know, iPhone touch screen wouldn't work for me. I, I need a keypad. And it was at that conference I was told, ah, keypad are for all people, you know. That touch, touch, touch screen was the way to go. And at that conference I was also told about mobile computing, cloud, uh, cloud computing and stuff. And in my mind at that point in time, when I heard about all this, in my mind, um, I then realized that, hey, all those things that we have always struggled against in school, um, 
I always half joke to the teachers I teach is that when you walk into a classroom, the moment you walk into a classroom, you are already automatically outnumbered. There's only one of you, but there are many of the students. So structurally, we have problems. How do we cater to the needs of so many children? How do we organize our activities, the differentiation that we have talked about? How do we meet the needs? How do we have data and deal with the data? Perhaps with cloud computing, perhaps with mobile uh, devices, we can make this come about. So in a sense, what Dennis talked about uh, earlier in the morning when he says that classrooms do look different nowadays. It's perhaps um, you know, one of the consequences of some of these technology. I go back to this because at that point in time in 2010 when I was leading a school and thinking about what do I want the school to look like seven years down the line and all, I turned to what the people out there were saying and if you know of the New Horizon uh, reports, they would go about trying to tell you what are the um, technologies that are available and they will take root in one year and they will uh, go two years and four years and five years down the line. So if you see that when I was in 2010, cloud computing was the kind of thing and they were talking about uh, mobiles in two or three years down the line. And yes, these are the things that have uh, come about. And if you look at now further down the line, look at now at 2016, um, I, I tried to look for 2017, but it's not out yet. If you look at 2016 and what they're saying would be the kind of things that we should be thinking about in terms of a future education landscape, then it would be referring to the kind of things that was mentioned earlier on about maker spaces, and I think the next speaker will be talking about that. We'll be talking about a little bit more flexible online learning um, that might be able to bring about that kind of personalized learning that is mentioned in the last um, row there. And that is the thing that fascinates me. It's something also to, to latch on to Lai Ching's point about a revolving door. Is it possible that with the structural difficulties that we, that we have one teacher and many students, can we have uh, technology to help us create that personalized kind of learning for our students. Um, before I continue to comment on that, maybe we'll play a quick video uh, so that we can see for ourselves some of these technologies that are already out there and available. Important developments in educational technology. First up, the key trends likely to drive technology planning and decision making over the next five years. In the long term, redesigning learning spaces and rethinking how schools work. As emerging technologies gain a solid foothold, schools are rethinking the traditional design of the classroom. Flexible learning environments must promote interactivity and enable active learning, so schools are redesigning rooms to focus on pedagogy and layout. There is also a focused movement to reinvent the entire school experience. Leaders are rethinking how schools work, allowing opportunities for multidisciplinary learning and ample room for independent study. People learn and work differently than previous generations, and current workforce trends demand changes to schooling that emphasize 21st century skills. In the midterm trends, accelerating technology adoption for the next three to five years, collaborative learning refers to students or teachers working together in peer-to-peer -peer or group activities. Successful collaborative learning strategies encourage increased student achievement, discussion, confidence, and active learning. Deeper learning approaches are expected to impact schools over the next three to five years, engaging students in critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, and self-directed learning. Students who learn how their knowledge and skills impact the world around them are better able to develop ideas themselves and take control of how they engage with a subject. Coding as literacy is a short-term trend, driving tech adoption in K-12 for the next one to two years. As computer science remains one of the fastest growing industries, Schools are adjusting to train the future workforce in areas of need. K-12 students are learning to code from a young age, designing websites, developing educational games and apps, and prototyping new products. Students as creators also falls in the short-term trends, as learners are exploring subject matter through the act of creation rather than the consumption of content. Many educators believe that honing these kinds of creative skills in learners can lead to deeply engaging learning experiences in which students become the authorities on subjects through investigation, storytelling, and production.
The project's expert panel also outlined six significant challenges that could impede technology adoption in K-12 education if unresolved. A solvable challenge is something that we understand and know how to solve. Authentic learning experiences bring students in touch with real-world problems and work situations, preparing them to be successful in higher ed and the workforce. As schools incorporate more active learning practices, they need to rethink the roles of teachers. Teachers will need to shift their primary responsibilities from providing expert level knowledge to constructing learning environments that help students gain 21st century skills. A difficult challenge is one we understand, but for which solutions are elusive. Digital equity refers to the uneven access to high-speed broadband. While more schools are benefiting from improved internet connectivity, the growing pervasiveness of blending learning approaches is illuminating new gaps between those with and without high-speed internet. Scaling teaching innovations is another difficult challenge, as schools are not yet adept at moving teaching innovations into mainstream practice. Lack of incentives for educators is often cited as the main challenge to growing teaching innovations. A wicked challenge is complex to even define, much less address. The achievement gap is a particularly wicked challenge, as an abundance of research supports the relationship between socioeconomic status and student achievement. Progressive systems that provide more funding to higher needs schools are needed to correct this imbalance. Personalized learning fosters a student-centered environment, empowering them to take charge of their education and nurture habits of lifelong learning. This challenge is wicked as the field has not yet reached consensus on the definition of personalized learning. The report also breaks down adoption horizons for important educational technology developments. In the one year or less adoption horizon, makerspaces are becoming more popular in K-12 environments thanks to their hands-on nature. Students in makerspaces learn valuable skills such as designing, prototyping, and creative thinking. Online learning refers to both formal and informal educational opportunities that take place through the web. The acceleration of online learning to widespread actually in part to schools implementing BYOD, or bring your own device policies. In the two to three year adoption horizon, robotics and virtual reality are expected to make a big impact. Robotics can be useful in classrooms to help students absorb STEM concepts. They enable students to simulate, observe, and make sense of complex scenarios. In the K-12 sector, virtual reality is well positioned as an educational tool, generating immersive environments for field trips, with simulation and research activities serving as a prime enabler of student-centered, experiential, and collaborative learning. In the last adoption horizon, four to five years from full adoption, artificial intelligence. AI's goal is to bolster productivity and engagement which makes it promising for education as teaching and learning continues to increasingly take place online. Wearable technology is also in the four to five year adoption horizon. Today's wearables have the potential to interest a variety of students in STEAM learning, as classroom activities can encompass multidisciplinary efforts of design, building, and programming. The NMC Coast and Horizon Report 2016 K-12 edition okay. is available now. Download your free copy at go.nmc.org slash 2016-K12. Right. Thank you very much. So what you have seen earlier on, uh, uh, you know, the last column, some of the things that are already happening, I, happily I see them in schools. I hear that the primary school kids now, uh, they're prototyping this little wristband in which they can go and tap and pay for their recess work and you can use it, uh, take a bus and the it will give data to the parents whether they've even gotten on the bus and stuff like that. Now, how cool will it be that with this same wearable technology, they can go through the classroom and immediately uh, the, there's data to tell the child which which section in the room that they go, should go to for the mathematics because they're further on in mathematics than some of their friends. Uh, their, their activities are really curated for them and they can go and do their maths there compared with somebody else. So. My point is, um, I, I'm not saying that technology is the cure-all, but I'm just saying that perhaps we might want to investigate how technology can help us take, um, you know, take that one more step towards personalised learning for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tay, for the presentation on personalised learning. I think it comes very timely. Uh, just two weeks ago, I think MOE launched some Singapore student learning space student learning space, online, some e-learning platform, right, that allows students to learn at their own pace. Uh, just another takeaway, I think, from watching that video, teachers will still have a job, I think, in five to ten years' time, but the role that teachers play, like the video said, will change, and maybe the way that teachers are, t are taught at NIE has to change, maybe. <laughs> so it's lifelong learning for them as well. Okay, with that, the third speaker for today is um, Rushdie Kaiwul. Rushdie, please. 
interesting. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, to IPS for inviting me. Uh, my name is Rishi. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Reactor. Uh, but before I begin, could I have a show of heads? Um, how many teachers do we have in the audience right now? Teachers or, or staff from MOE? Yes? Okay, so on behalf of all of us here, happy Teacher's Day. Thank you so much for all the sacrifice and guidance you've given us. Let's give a round of applause for all our teachers, please. Yeah. So today is um, also quite special for me as well because um, actually Mrs. Lim right, um, was my principal. Um, she used to know me when I was small and annoying. Now I'm big and annoying and she I'm still so knows me. I'm so proud of him. So thanks Mrs. Lim. Right, so without further ado, um, just a bit about myself. I used to be from Spring. I was on the Business Excellence Division consulting for Singaporean SMEs. Uh, currently I'm on the Youth Council of the Singapore HR Institute. So we look at the future of work. Uh, and today I'd like to share about um, three parts, right? Um, I'm going to share some macro data as well as some of the things that we do to contextualize the classroom for an entrepreneurial environment. Uh, a bit about context, uh, this is our company's mission to cultivate the galaxy best young founders and we believe that the world's biggest problem is that there are not enough young people solving the world's biggest problems. So we want to get kids to use technology as a force for good. So not necessarily build another Uber for cats or an Airbnb for dogs, but to solve something really beyond that. And we do this through three ways. One is that we run training programs for students between the ages of 14 to 24. Secondly, we have a psychometric tool that we've built. Students answer 100 questions and it tells them what kind of role they're best suited for in the startup. So this is useful for students who are uh, interested in the startup scene as part of education and career guidance. Um, what we're most proud of is that we meet up with our students who continue working on their projects every last Saturday of the month. So this is under Reactive Ventures. And then most recently, uh, last year, um, we were involved in the Committee for Future Economy where we met up with teachers and startup co-founders. And what we wanted to do is that we wanted to build a support community for teachers who taught entrepreneurship, innovation, business and design. So that gave birth to the Reactor Educator Network, which I'll be sharing about later today. And as a whole, we wanted to take an ecosystem approach um, to developing the levels of entrepreneurial development in our students in Singapore and beyond. And uh, without further ado, uh, let me talk about the first part, which is um, attitudes, shifting attitudes towards entrepreneurship. So every year, there is an organization called the GUESSS, Global University Entrepreneurship Spirit Student Survey. So it's quite a mouthful. And um, they survey thousands of students worldwide in the universities. And so from this graph, actually, we see two very interesting points. Was, uh, and number one is that in 2011, Singaporean undergrads showed greater entrepreneurial aspiration compared to their global peers. But in 2014, they showed less. Um, and the second point is that across the years, the interest in starting up has actually decreased, um, whether it is right after graduation or five years after graduation. So this is an interesting statistic because we always thought that we have more startups right now. Actually, the number of startups has increased four times over the past five years. Um, so what does this mean? And if you compare this against the global data uh, between 2011, 2014, and 2016, right? Um, what we, so what we see is that actually uh, there has been a consistent increase in, um, of undergraduates wanting to be an employee and a decrease uh, of those of them who want to be a founder, right? So this is also interesting um, because what it also means uh, is that it affects the way we teach students and have, have, have them have an awareness of what entrepreneurial skills are. Right? So the first thing is that uh, interest in startups decreases when the economy is doing well. And the reason why is because students find it attractive to stay in jobs when, they, when the economy is doing well in the regular market. Um, and then secondly is that there actually has been improvement in entrepreneurship education. So more students are now conversant about what it means to start something and they make a better cost-benefit analysis before they do so. Secondly is that entrepreneurial aptitude is demanded by employees still. So the future of work right, requires um, students, for example, have grit resilience, uh, being able to be adaptable, so on and so forth. And these are traits that employers continuously and increasingly uh, value. And then finally is that having an entrepreneurial uh, mindset um, gives about a growth mindset for our students. It, has, it gives them um, the comfort to be learners for life, right? And when these students were asked, you know, how would you grade yourself in terms of your confidence in each of these personal skills, uh, whether it is being a leader or being a communicator, et cetera, consistently across the board, students that have intention to start something graded themselves to be more confident compared to students who don't, right? And if we assume that managing innovation and being professional and being able to network are skills that employers value, then maybe having an entrepreneurial education um, framework for our schools is something that we want to consider for the future of work. And um, society does have a role to play. So if actually if you look at the first three bar graphs, um, we're talking about 
um, societal requirements and instructors, spelling out details, um, having highly structured lives, a few unexpected events. Singapore consistently scores higher compared to the global average. And um, this is antithetical to what a startup is, right? Where you deal with high levels of uncertainty. So this is very interesting in terms of how society is viewing the concept of starting up. And then what's also interesting, and I included this as well, is the perception of parents towards the achievements of their child. So for Singapore at 5.61, that is lower than the average of 5.9. And if you look at the last graph, it shows that our children think less about our achievements compared to us thinking about their achievements, right? So the home actually does have a role to play in terms of how um, we get our students to be interested in starting up. So in the second part, I'd like to share about some of these entrepreneurial knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And we've actually developed a framework um, to help uh, students think about this. So school teaches you a type of thinking called causal reasoning, which is one plus one equals to what? But when you graduate into the real world, you use a different type of thinking called effective reasoning, or what plus what equals to one. So you know where you want to be, the laws and frameworks are there, but there are multiple ways to get there. And a lot of students grapple with this change in mindset because all of a sudden, there's no tenure series and there's no one right answer. That is the biggest mindset shift that entrepreneurial education tries to get students to adopt. It is being comfortable with ambiguity, being comfortable with uncertainty. So the framework that we looked at was something called the five elements of entrepreneurial aptitude. And the interesting thing here is that they happen to be paradoxes. So for example, fire, um, being able to have bias to action and grit and resilience. The opposite of that is water, which is being uh, adaptable. And water takes the shape of whichever container it's in. And then, of course, you have air and earth. But right in the center, um, something that we found to be very different about entrepreneurs and self-starters was the concept of being autodidactic, which is the ability to pick up whatever it is that you want to learn without the need of a formal teacher. And start co-founders do this very well, because if they need to learn digital marketing, they will do it. If not, the company is going to die. So, that's something that we wanted to imbibe in students. How do we get them to help that self-starter and growth mindset? And we bring them through um, this throughout the entire stage of development as they go about uh, turning their ideas into projects and their projects into companies. So this is what we call the five stages of entrepreneurial development, uh, bringing them through exploration and self-discovery, understanding their strengths, as well as understanding their areas for improvement. And how we apply this to the classroom is that we use a psychometric tool called Emergenetics. So Emergenetics subscribes that there are four types of thinking styles analytical, structural, social, and conceptual. And if you know what thinking preference your students have, you can actually kind of personalize the way you teach them. So if your student has a social preference, for example, they might prefer to learn through people and with people. If they have a conceptual preference, they might prefer to work um, through experimentation. So they're not going to listen to instructions. They're just going to go out there and just going to try it. And when we ask students, how would you go shopping? And we uh, group them according to their uh, thinking preference. This was the result. So all the analytical thinkers, uh, they came out with a cost-benefit analysis, what I should bring, etc. You had structural thinkers who showed a uh, penchant for process and how to go about dividing time in terms of duration. Your social thinkers um, looked at who else is going to go shopping with me, what can I do with other, other people around. And then you have the conceptual thinkers, right, who had a very uh, pe uh, strong preference for divergent thinking, right? So how we contextualize this to the classroom, especially in building an entrepreneurial classroom, was that we try to engage different types of thinking preferences through the various activities that we do. So for example, when we gave the students the task of um, reverse engineering, you know, we gave them the exact slides that Airbnb used when they fundraised, and we asked them to uh, analyze this and to build a deck for their own startup. Right? So that's analytical and structural preference being used in the classroom. Uh, we did Edu Scrum, so this is um, something that um, is used in Finland as well and as well as lots of startups, what you do is that you get the students to peer teach each other, um, and then they will place post-it notes denoting the number of chapters. So for example, under to do, you might have five chapters. You, when they're doing it, they bring it over to doing, um, and then review, so on and so forth. And our job as coaches and trainers, right, is to quiz the students when they're at the review stage, and if they need to relearn with each other, we'll bring it back to to do. Uh, the validation board, and this is a tool that startups use to validate ideas. Um, if you notice there in the center black square, there's something called get out of the building. That's when we actually do get the students to go out of the classroom and validate their ideas after prototyping something. Meaning to say that if you had students that are building an app for a restaurant, we ask them to go and reach out to three to five restaurant managers, collect feedback, come back to the classroom, and then discuss with your peers and see what you've learned. And then finally, this is one of my favorite activities. Uh, it's called paperclip flipping. We give students a red paperclip and they are supposed to trade it up to something of higher value. And you can see in this photo here, they've traded everything from a, a pack of juice, an economist newspaper. Um, there's one time I, I, I gave it to a bunch of students and they came back for a Christmas tree. 
Um, yeah, so that was quite surprising. But the reason why this is interesting is because it teaches students something about um, adaptability, bias to action, I've got to go out there, I've got to do stuff. Um, I need to understand value means different things to different people. So these are 21st century skills um, that we get the students to do through the activities. And then finally, I'd like to share about how we are contextualizing the classroom right now. Um, as we mentioned, we started something called the Reactor Educator Network. And what we want to do is that we want to bring the startup world into the classroom. And we do this um, through various activities. So this was something we did at NYGH, at their makerspace. And what we did was that we got the teachers to pick up some of these tools that we use with the students, things like pop apps, striking, et cetera. And they got the chance to prototype some of these things. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So this was an experience prototyping booth uh, where we taught them how to use storytelling to convey value proposition. And what we do at the end of every learn, run uh, meetup, right, is that we design a lesson plan that we open source um, and we promulgate to all the teachers who are there. And then they can run the exact activity that we've done with them back in their own classroom. So this is how we're trying to scale our impact. Uh, we train the teachers and then the teachers can pick this up and then run it on their own. And this was something that we did with RAISE, which is the Singapore Centre for Social Enterprise. So one of the issues that we wanted to solve was that teachers didn't understand the difference between a VWO, a charity, um, a social enterprise, and so on and so forth. So we ran a game. Uh, in this case, you had um, teachers, you had to play different groups. So someone was blind, someone was an aging population member, someone was ex-convict, and we got them to build um, paper flowers and they actually had to sell it away. Right, so this was to show them that in Singapore, the definition of a social enterprise is the work integrated model, where your beneficiary has to be part of the value chain. Uh, if not, it's not called social enterprise. So they got a chance to play the game, and then we gave them the actual lesson plan that they could then run the game with the students. Yep, so this is uh, the lesson plan, which is basically an origami game. And we're currently working on other activities that we can do with teachers. So there's one on every entrepreneurship that's happening um, next year. I think the next one is on data science. If you have a student who's 16 year old in the classroom who's interested in data science, how would you communicate this to them? Um, it's all through activities and gameplay. Right, so concluding remarks, um, I think uh, I wanted to explain that being an entrepreneur is not equal to being entrepreneurial. Not everyone is gonna start a business, but I think we do need to get our students to be entrepreneurial to deal with uncertainty and to be comfortable with that. Uh, and all of us have a part to play in helping students to understand that what plus what equals to one, and there's not always one right answer. Thank you. Thank you, Wushdi, for, for the ground-up view of how you are teaching entrepreneurial out-of-the-box skills, 21st century skills to our young people today. That's right. With that, we'll move to the Q&A segment. If anyone from the floor wants to ask a question, could you please identify yourself and your organization? If there's no one, we can, I'll take something from the pigeonhole. There's a few questions here. Dr. Tay was saying that, oh, there's someone? Okay, sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for those three speeches. There's just so much information, it's completely dizzying. Um, okay, I'm from MCCY. I'm curious about arts education. What do you guys think about arts and education? This comes in two senses. One is uh, the teaching of arts specifically itself, such as, as we are used to, maybe drama class or painting class. And also uh, the use of art in education, that is using art to teach uh, fields that are not art. So we are used to, um, for example, using skits in history class. I wonder if any of um, the three of you have thoughts about this. Yeah. Thank great you. question. Uh, especially with regard to your topics of, yeah, yeah. Uh, for your speeches. No, I think it's a great question because I wanted to comment on Rusty's presentation that actually the key thing is not the entrepreneurial education, but the fact that we're now in a creator economy. No one's going to be presenting a job in front of you and say, please apply because we've got a job. You've got to find your own relevance and create your own significance and say, there is a need at a gap here, I'm going to be creating that company to fill that need or I'm going to make myself the solution, right? So when you now talk about art education, it is right smack in that creation space, right? Because an artist creates. So if you have got a child who is so exposed to art, music, the idea of self-expression creation and charting your own version of the world or your own version of some idea, this person is well placed for that creator economy or that gig economy, right? 
So, so that's my quick answer uh, to your question. But I'm sure the rest might have some ideas. Huh? Yeah, um, slightly biased, literature teacher at heart. <laughs> so in fact, during lunchtime, uh, somebody was commenting, we, we were just talking about how important uh, this aspect as well, the arts and the humanities in uh, all aspects. So earlier on, I thought that one of the questions, uh, which would be the subjects that we choose for school, uh, would have a, you know, yielded very rich discussion as well. What are the things that we in Singapore would consider important, not just in the future now as well? Thank you. Thank you. So the interesting thing is that uh, back when I was in secondary school, some of the things that I remember from social studies class, right, was when we did like mock United Nations and mock Parliament. It was theatre play, right? I still remember it. I can thank Mrs. Neil Terling for this. Um, but what I think right now that makes the arts education more interesting um, is actually the application of art, not just art, but aesthetics and design. Uh, and theatre, right, in some of the work skills that we need. So, for example, if you're looking at a startup, typically you will have a hacker, a hipster, and a hustler. It is typically the job of the hipster to understand what it means to convey value proposition to the end user. And if that person doesn't have a sense of aesthetics, or doesn't understand marketing communications, or doesn't understand theatrics, the value of that company is going to be lower. Lah. So, I would say actually more than ever, right, design and art um, and the aesthetics, right, is more important. Can I give a quick rejoinder, just be naughty, that, you know, people who advocate for arts always feel as though that's a minority perspective, so, you know, the whole world must understand its importance. When SMU presented to the Committee for Future Economy one or two ideas that could change how we see the economy coming out, we suggested that people or undergrads learn a skill that is not within their domain. So instead of saying, you know, uh, the, the majority of us should focus a bit more on art or to get people to do something else. It's the other way. Those who are more into the humanities and the social sciences or the artists, should you not take something in neuroscience or analytics? Because that's going to broaden your portfolio and broaden your skills. And that's going to contribute to your main work because it's a contrasting skill. Yeah. So this is the Steve Jobs sort of thing. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Pauline, that's a question. I really enjoy. I'm sorry I missed lighting, but then you know Aww. I really enjoy. Yeah, somebody caught me outside. Focus for our family. So <laughs> I I want to draw. You know, such the, when we talk about the future of education, you know, this this is the happening evolution now, right? Skills future, SMU Academy. They're you know preparing us for lifelong learning. I feel for the young generation. Mm -hmm the younger generation, because we're talking about school stress now, right? And so I want to tie your topic back to the topic that Matthew sucked me into. So how do we then align, in the, how do we convey this message to, to, to the younger cohorts, right? Because for them, the idea of education and being able to cross milestones and then a lot of time, by the time you come to university and you complete university, you go, oh, thank God, you know, I've arrived and now, you know, let me go off and do something else, right? Mm -hmm. But now we're telling them, your learning does not stop here and be prepared that you will be going back to school of a different kind, you know, throughout your life course. How can we package it and make sure that we have, you know, a proposal that can help the next generation prepare for this and, and to ensure that in the process we do not add to the stresses in their already stressful lives. Yeah. I think that is the question for Lai Ching. Oh, uh, can I? You know, just now I told Rusty I was so proud of him because he comes from a school where almost, what, 60% want to be a doctor and a lawyer and I'm glad he didn't choose the path. He chose the path of being an entrepreneur. And he took on a uh, sort of uh, a course that kept him here, but at the same time, he was doing a lot of his work already whilst he was at university. Right, so the message I would give to parents and educators really is relax. Relax because, you know, um, what, is, what are the more important skills that's going to make a person run that marathon, which is where we're talking about all this digital transformation and disruption. 
your ability to be creative, right? Your ability to deal with uh, circumstances that you did not predict before. Negotiation, how to make people like you? How do, how do you negotiate? How do you influence so that people will buy your idea? I think those are a lot more important than scoring that 99 marks for your math. So if, if we could get that message to parents and educators so that in the end, the, uh, the child himself understands that his intuition is actually not wrong, that he can actually pursue his uh, strength or passion, if you we usually put it, I think that will help overall. Rushdie or Dr. Tick? Yeah, so I'd like to comment. Um, and this is something that my literature teacher told me, um, and it's that remarks are better than marks. Ah, uh, nice. Remarks are better than marks. And it's something that stuck with me through life because I realized that um, when you work in a startup, right, you have to have this iterative mindset where you launch things even though it's premature and you go like feedback from the market and then you start to tell yourself, you know, actually what's the worst that can happen? I can still come back again. I can still launch something new, right? And how we run this in the classroom is that, for example, we don't give first, sec second, third prizes. We give out superlative prizes, right? Why? Who is to say that your startup is better than someone else's? Because in five years' time, it might be overtaken. We don't know. And then what we wanted to do is that we wanted to get students to be able to still have that internal locus of control, which is, you know, if I, I fail, I'm still in control. I'm still going to make that conscientious effort to try again. And that's the grit and resilience part. You don't want them to lose their self-agency. Yeah. It's interesting that it was, uh, the learning, lifelong learning, was positioned as something stressful. That, you know, keep on learning is going to be something bad. It may not be, not necessarily. I mean, personally, I challenge myself to learn one new thing each year because that keeps me humble. I think a lot of times as a teacher, I forget, uh, I go into class and why aren't they getting it? You know, what's wrong with them? You know, kind of thing. We, we might forget that for them, learning it for the first time uh, may be incredibly difficult. I think of learning as um, going to a place that's totally new. You've not been there. The teacher has been there. The teacher has been there many times over, over, over the years, across many um, classes. But for the child, it's their first time going towards that part, that, that, that area they've never been to. It can be incredibly frightening. And so that could be the stressful part. I, I, I hear from the parents here, and I'm wondering whether it's also because for them, it's also a brave new world. They, they don't know what it looks like, and so it's, it's stressful in that sense. And so perhaps learning can be not stressful if it can be such that, as, as uh, pointed out, when there's a sense of self-efficacy, I know how to get there and I can control. I think a, a lot of time stress can be because we can't control what's going on. We, are, we have to go at the same pace as everybody else. Half the time it could be too fast or half the time it could be too slow and then I, I could be bored. And so if that could be a case where we are, are more cognizant of the kind of pace the kind of learning that needs to take place, they have a choice in the kind of learning, maybe it wouldn't be so stressful. Thank you. We will take one question from the pigeonhole, okay, because it seems to be getting a lot of votes. Okay, it's to do with the digital divide. So probably Dr. Tay can start off on the, give, an, uh, uh, give a response and then if, or Bushti wants to jump sure. in later on. Yeah. yeah. So I remember this morning there was somebody, a speaker, who said that uh, got the kids to write down, I wish my teacher knew. And one of the kids wrote that, I wish my teacher knew I didn't have pencils at home. I mean, that, that is technology in that sense. We, we always think of technology as something really big and expensive and stuff like that. Um, a pencil way back when, a pen way back when was a, a piece of technology as well. So I think the, the question here is perhaps can be framed against a bigger uh, background of resources, not, not necessarily technologies and expensive technology. And um, it could be that we can think of it, obviously, in terms of support, either from the school, or the school board, MOE, uh, in terms of the technologies that is uh, to be given out to schools. So I'm glad that in, in MOE we're talking about almost like means testing kind of thing where the schools with less uh, with the lower SES gets a little bit more help and so they can get more of that uh, resources to help them and so to, to avoid this digital divide. But it could be from uh, other ways in which um, we, not necessarily equipping every child with the technology. It could be really low-tech ways in which, uh, or maybe 
ways in which it is just the teacher holding on to uh, one particular device rather than worrying about the different children having a, uh, uh, the devices. I give you an example of, of what I mean is that um, there's one particular uh, app called Plickers. Are, are the teachers here? In, uh, does anybody use Plickers? Plickers. Plick, not, not Clickers, but Plickers. Plickers. Okay, it's because in the schools that I work with in NIE, um, the teachers uh, are very uncomfortable with each kid having their own devices because then, you know, they can go and serve and do all sorts of other things rather than pay attention to uh, the lesson. So, uh, one of the quick polling and quick formative assessment tool that can be used is this thing called Plickers. So, the children are given uh, a card that's printed out with almost like a QR code kind of thing uh, and it has each side uh, represents A, B, C, D and the only device that's needed in that classroom is the teacher because the, 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 the teacher will ask a question and then the kids will hold up their card, their plickers that represents uh, whether they think the answer is A, B, C or D and the, the only device that is needed in that class is the teacher's handphone to just quickly scan and immediately the teacher knows uh, what was the majority, what the majority thing was the answer and who uh, on her part she will be able to get the data as to who answered what and then can follow up on that data. So there are things like that that are not um, you know, terribly expensive, uh, it is something that can help control but I take your point about the creating a digital divide and I, I take your point that yes we have to be very mindful about that when we talk about technology and education. Thank you. I think technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, we're doing a lot of work with adult teaching just on mobile devices, handphone, and I think a lot of our students, even when parents don't feel they can afford it, would still somehow have a handphone. A lot of our students have handphones. And you can do a lot with uh, new platforms like Nobi and SmartUp, where even, though even DBS and the banks, uh, Unilever, they are pushing out um, in-house training through that mobile device. And a CEO can immediately know through the quizzes who are the top scorers and where the talent is, uh, like FinTech and all within their uh, organization if they're just starting out on their journey. So I think there are many, many ways we can get around this, apart from, of course, financial aid and funding, which all our educators are so sensitive about. I don't think anyone would be missed out, really. Yeah. Right. So um, now this is actually a very difficult question for me and I was thinking about it um, because I have worked with um, some students overseas like in Surabaya or in Bangkok, right? And then in places where there is insufficiently strong Wi-Fi, it's very hard for us to do online prototyping on websites, for example, or to teach students some of these coding languages. So I think there has to be some sort of base, say for example, Wi-Fi infrastructure that should be fast enough or that you have at least a basic computing device. Mm -hmm. And in which case, if you do not have that basic infrastructure, then yes, I think this digital divide is going to be um, ex uh, exacerbated. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, I think, um, yes, I think that the cost of technology is actually reducing. Uh, a lot of these things students can do for free. There are freemium things that they can do. Um, but I think because of the nature of work and the future of work, it necessitates that we need to get these devices into the hands of our young whether finding it through funding through one means or another means, or being creative in how we do this, or alternatively, signaling to the market that this is an important issue, and having some startup co-founders right, to find a clever way to modify the business model to still address this. Actually, can I add one point, which is that I think technology can close the social divide rather than exacerbate it. Because if you are talking about personalized learning, like what Dr. Tay was sharing, within an e-learning system, a learning management system. If your assessments and your work can be divided up into competencies and through your assignments, you know where your students' weaknesses are. When a student has that weakness, it takes the, the artificial intelligence or the machine learning can take you to do a lot more exercises within your area of weakness. Any amount of time you want to put in as a single child, uh, as an individual, you actually can close the academic divide. Because it's no longer about tuition, it's you with that free resource and that machine telling you where your weaknesses are and giving you other exercises to do. So you have different learning pathways. 
So this is personalized learning through artificial intelligence, through a mobile platform or a technology platform that an institution provides that an individual does not need to pay for, right? Thank you, Lai Ching. Since we're on the topic of divides, there's another question on pigeonhole on a different kind of divide that is directed to you, Lai Ching. So, uh, divides. Uh, more to do with uh, downstream divides. So, let me try and get it up. It's linked to your presentation on um, mm -hmm. skill sets and algorithms. So, yeah. Will, will there be, I guess, a, a, a portion of society that cannot benefit from? Yeah the future of the future yeah. economy. Actually, you realize that at different levels within an organization, you need a different sort of person, right? Not everyone's looking for that top CEO, the one with the complex problem solving. I put out an ad just for a manager. I just need someone meticulous who can look through all my receipts and bills and make sure that people who come for my courses get built and someone who can set up somehow uh, when I have training, you know, just do the the make sure the cost materials are there and all. So there are different sorts of jobs. But if you remember the um, graph, um, that table I put up about 40, 47% of a job would be automated and all, of course you realize that sooner or later, something can do your job better. So I think the onus is on individuals to say, how can I push myself one level up each time? The, the most uh, sought after jobs, if you go to jobtech.sg, are the ones to do with software development, data security, info security, uh, data analytics. These are at current, currently the most sought after jobs, which tells you that with big data and all, people are also looking for others who can deal, uh, applicants who are able to deal with data to, to improve revenues, to improve customer service, to improve school results or the outcomes or performance outcomes of your company. So I guess there would be differentiation and different levels of jobs for individual, but all of us must scale up actually. So um, I'd like to comment uh, mm. because I work closely with HR professionals as well. Um, the thing that your AI so far has not been able to predict is culture fit with the organization as well as values and motivators of the individual. Mm -hmm. Skill is just one component of competency. So when you're looking at definition of competency is knowledge, skills and attitudes. Right? Attitudes is one big portion that employees are looking at. How coachable is this candidate? Right? Is this candidate able to fit into my uh, organization? Mm -hmm. Will he or she um, upset the rest of my team? And with the case of less skilled applicants, right, what they need to show is coachability and their ability to learn. So I may be less skilled now, but if you read um, the body of knowledge that Angela Dutworth from University of Pennsylvania put up on GRIT, um, she has this very interesting um, equation, which is talent multiplied by skill equals, sorry, um, talent multiplied by effort equals to skill, and skill multiplied by effort equals to achievement. So in that equation, effort is manifested twice. Yeah, so that was um, her research, right, on what it means to have grit. So if your skill applicant, for, if your applicant, for example, has lesser skill, but puts in that effort, over time, he or she will have higher achievement than someone else who doesn't. Yeah. A friend of mine actually developed a game. Um, he runs I mean, he was actually a professor at SMU, Mark Nowacki. And he's got a game which allows us to assess a person's collaborative skills, global and situational intelligence. So by playing this game, and I wish I could do that, Pauline has just left, but I wish we could ask every applicant to SMU to play this game. Then we don't have to interview everybody, which is of course the feature of SMU, we interview everybody before we take them in because these are the skills we want, collaborative intelligence, situational and global intelligence, whether you can work with people, whether you are patient, whether you can deal with ambiguity and whether you're agile enough when situations change, because these are the skills that will be, make an SMU grad very marketable. Not just the ones we come with the A-level grades or the GPA from Polytechnic. Yeah. So I think in good time, hopefully, machine learning or artificial intelligence can also test those social traits or the individual character traits. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Since we're on the topic of skills and how it's being valued now, there's this question on whether the current exam system should stay. So, because... Uh, <laughs> I was an MOE official once. <laughs> the exam in a previous lifetime. <laughs> So 
can see it on the screen now. Yes, um, I guess all three of you can can jump in. I will start with Lai Ching, I guess. Yeah. Maybe Dr. Tay wants to have a go at it first. Gone. I thought we could get away with <laughs> not touching on hot button issues uh, like the assessment system. Um, I think it, it's quite clear that uh, from our discussion this morning that uh, it's, it's a lot of, about the consequences of the examination system of, of its own as well. Because if it is that um, the examinations are testing those very core skills, because you, you can't be creative in a vacuum or be critical thinking in a vacuum. You, you have to have stuff to be uh, thinking about. It. So if it is that these are the things that are important and we can test them validly, um, then those are the things that you can stay, but it's, I think at the end of it all, it's also the, stre the, the stressors and it's what can these scores lead to. Um, uh, places in the universities, further up in uh, you know, secondary school and stuff like that. Uh, things that, alternatives or notable change and stuff like that, I think some of the issues uh, previously that has to do with, let's say, alternative forms of assessments were not quite doable because there wasn't the infrastructure to help support it. Um, I myself, my, my own area of research is authentic assessments. And so we've been looking at, you know, in MOE, when we talk about um, alternative assessments, like, for example, having the kids like in craft and tech and all this sort of thing, it's because they're smaller candidature. It's very hard, let's say, for the science, in you know, the SPA, the science practical skills assessment and all that kind of thing, to, to try and hold uh, some degree of inter rater reliability and, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and if it were be that we can do it in such a way like, uh, for example, the kind of things that Lai Ching is talking about uh, where we can do it in using technology to help us capture that kind of data, then maybe we can explore different types of assessments apart from the ones that we currently have to do because high turn turnaround time is demanded. Uh, we, I hear that PSLE has to be marked within about five days and the poor primary school teachers are sitting there like, you know, uh, the very factory kind of thing, just churn out the results and stuff like that. If there are other ways in which we can tap upon uh, to help us get that data, to help us more reliably make a statement of the kids' level of achievement, then I think that there is value for thinking about that change. Okay. I do really want to go into wishful thinking here. And also, I don't want to be misquoted to say that, that, you know, this is fake news. I didn't say it. And please play the video to prove that I didn't say it. So I don't really want to comment on whether at the moment we should do away with the exams or not. But the, you notice that the O and A levels feed into the higher education, you know, universities like NUS, NTU, SMU. And the results of the universities feed into the job market. Right, so if I'm starting to say that employers are looking at skills and all those kind of competencies they want at various levels and not so much the degree, then of course then it does have an impact on how much effort you want to put in during your days as a student or whether you want to do startups and all to impress the industry. And a number of my undergrads, I noticed they're going for professional accreditation whilst on a job as an undergrad. They are getting their Institute of Banking and Finance credit accreditations, they are doing um, industry back um, certificates so that once they get a job, they're already you know, seen as people who are certified. So they're quite driven that way. Um, tracking back then, if then the higher education setups like in universities are not just looking at A-level grades, uh, three A's, four A's, etc., or your GPA at Polytechnic, what can they look for? So the Minister for Education, uh, Higher Ed, has been asking the universities if they will broaden their admissions criteria a bit to accept those who've had post-diploma certs, who have not got their undergrad, and to have us look at their work experience and their work attitude for admission. Because these would have been the people who didn't make it going by the traditional selection criteria. Could we give them you know, the regard to recognize um, their qualifications from work, recognition of prior learning, or even for those in the Earn and Learn program at the Polytechnic to also take some of those in. So they're hoping for a kind of expansion of the articulation pathway to university. And if our universities are open enough to do that, I think that will change 
the O and A levels uh, or our attitude towards you know, going and zooming for the top grades and all. There are two systems that I want to draw your attention to. One, there's a university called Minerva, M-I-N-E-R-V-A. It started by saying that there will be no physical building, but that the students in this university would be at three different or four different cities uh, each semester. And they will learn intercultural skill, they will learn from what the city offers, and they will learn from online um, sort discussions. of resources and discussions. And, and the, I think the most precious thing is those interrelationship, uh, in peer relationships, working in groups, getting to know a different culture, understanding uh, a city and the complexities of jobs and culture and people within each city. If I were an employer, I would take any one of those graduates because they are able to survive in a multicultural setting. They are able to survive in an environment that's not been built because uh, it was a physical structure with everything predictable. And I was happy to note that one of our, my former students from the secondary, uh, from the A-level school where I was a principal, had actually been accepted as a student of Minerva University. And they'd taken people who've actually rejected places in Harvard and Stanford to just join this new exciting university. Recently, I was approached to consider working with a a new concept of high school. And this um, tycoon or education uh, person who has been involved in education wants to build 25 schools across the world. And he wants just one curriculum. But at different semesters, students will be able to study in different campuses. And they will learn, again, this whole idea of intercultural skills, being in a place, getting to know, being adaptable, being agile. And I think any university or top university would want a high school student from any one of these schools who've graduated because they are going to be displaying the kind of skills we want in a very uh, volatile, complex environment and world. Yeah. So I think certain things must whack this. It's not just going to be a policy decision whether we should do away with exams or not because parents are stressed and students are stressed. That should not be the consideration. The consideration is what is wagging the school system, uh, what is really influencing and wagging the tail, if you like, or the tail wagging the main system, and what's going to be important for survival. Thank you. Perhaps be before Rushdi starts, I can recast the question a little bit mm -hmm. and put it to you, Rushdi, because you are living your dream now. You are an entrepreneur, teaching entrepreneurial skills, but you went through the system. PSLE, O levels, A levels. So, did you see any value in these high stakes exams that made you what you are today? Okay, so I'm going to speak uh, from personal experience. Uh, and I think uh, the education, right, is in hindsight uh, always great. But I realized now when I was like 18 doing A levels, uh, I was miserable. Uh, you know, <laughs> staying at the library uh, till very late, trying to figure out why you know, I couldn't get this answer right, why I cannot hit level three on my econs paper, uh, so on and so forth. So actually, when you're in it itself, uh, it's actually very painful. It's only after you graduate that you say, oh yeah, you know what? When I was in cons, I understood some of these frameworks, now I can apply it to my startup. When I studied history, now I can understand why it's so important for us to not make the same mistakes that you know, humans did over the past 50 to 200 years. So it's always great in hindsight. Um, and what I think, this, of how this affects the future of education, right, is that we cannot run away from educating our students in basic skills like literacy and numeracy. And in this case, things like PSLE, right, is an efficient way for us to, to measure some of these things, right? But sometimes it's a detriment of the student. For students who can rise above this and do well, it's great because then they pick up things like discipline, Right? I've, got some, I've got a lot of homework to do, but you know what? I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to have that self-awareness. I'm going to figure out what kind of way works best for me when I'm picking up something new. Do, am I a visual or auditory learner? How do I take notes? Some of these things right, are things that are transferable to the workplace, except that we don't see it because it's so painful at that point in time. Um, my concern is actually for students who don't do so well. Right? It's going to be very painful for them because there are ramifications. And I think what we can do as a society is, how do we demonstrate to them that all is not lost? Like, okay, you know what, you didn't do so well at, at this um, high stakes exam, but there are so many other things that you can do, and we need to demonstrate that. And I think um, two organizations that can help to do this are one is employers. So as an employer myself, right, the first thing I do is that don't need to send me photocopies of your A-level results or university degrees or whatever, because I'm not going to look at it. I'm looking at your skills, your values, 
right? You as a person, what is your moral fiber like, right? And then the second thing is actually the scholarship system, so which I happen to be a product of, right? I think scholarships also do send a signal out to society, and um, for Singaporean society, we actually do listen to some of these signals um, that are being sent out. Right. So at the higher level, at IHH level, I think that is where we can actually start to remove some of these assessments. Why? Because we all know that when we go through university, we don't use every single piece of content that we picked up. Yeah, we realize, hey, you know what, I'm not using like half of what I learned in university. So what does that mean? Why are we assessing some of these things which are not being applied? Um, and for this, right, I, I recommend three ways in which we could change assessment at high level. Uh, one is the portfolio assessment. So it's not just one high stakes exam where I write an essay for three hours. Um, second one is collaborative assessment. We do exams in pairs, so no longer as individuals, because that is the future of collaboration, and you have all your information with you at your fingertips. And the third thing is iterative assessment, meaning to say that I give you back your essay, you got a B, you have another chance, rewrite it again, can you get an A? Because that is the future of work. It is going to be iterative. It's not just one mission critical thing. It's going to be how you grow and learn from some of your mistakes and apply yourself better the next time. Thank you, Ushdi. Um, with that, I think it was a nice way to wrap up the whole this panel discussion as well as the, as the day's proceedings. Um, the, the whole education system, is, I guess, is a work in progress. That, that's a key takeaway for me as a chairperson. Uh, and I guess we all of us have a part to play in uh, improving the system, whether it's stress or building up well-rounded individuals or building up 21st century skills in our children and employees, I guess, also have a, have a part to play. So with that, um, please join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, uh, um, thank you as well to all of you for joining us today. And we would like to also thank our events and admin team and our IT team for making all of this possible. Thank you. See you all at the next um, IPS event. We also have um, reports for this event on our website in a couple of days' time if you are interested. So um, with that, thank you and have a good long weekend.